Hi, and welcome to Magic Numbers. This is episode number 45. And today we're going to be talking about timing the picks. It's all going to be all about wheeling cards and why some cards are picked by some groups of players and not by other groups of players. And we're also going to try to maybe catch some points about card evaluation and how does it differ at the beginning level and maybe intermediate level and uh, people that are winning quite a lot on in best of one. So uh, what is the difference in their card evaluation and why some people fall into traps and uh, why that can actually cost them the win rate. But before we dive into the podcast and seminar, a word from the sponsor, because I am a sponsored person. Um, uh, this seminar and my articles are also going to be available on mtgazone.com. Uh, mtgazone.com is a website where you can find your news, uh, where you can find your updates, where you can find the best decks currently. Uh, also, when you can find some pretty good limited content, and I'm not even talking about myself, obviously. I'm talking about other people who are writing for the website, and uh, that includes J2S Josh and uh, Icky. So, you know, really, really good limited players who can share their insight with you. And uh, I would highly advise you to check them out after the seminar, uh, see if that is something that interests you. If you're not into limited, well, you're in for a long, long seminar then. But um, if you're not into limited, there is also people uh, that write in Constructed. Uh, Paulo Vitor Damodorosa is writing for them. So you will find the content for yourself, I'm pretty sure. But OK, let's dive into my seminar. First, as always, I start with my very brief preamble. Um, and today, I'm going to be talking about one of the key skills in draft, and it's knowing when your pick is worth more than one card. And this is something that I might be, maybe intuitively I knew before, but um, the full realization of that was one of the Court of Calls uh, podcasts uh, with uh, Ryan Sachs, when Ryan Sachs was telling that in some formats, he would pick a weaker card as, you, as his pack one, pick one, because he knew that picking that card he would also wheel something else, very likely. Uh, and this card that was weaker than maybe something that was stronger in the pack, plus the other card that was synergistic with it, was worth more to him than picking the better card. And it's this almost guarantee of wheeling something that would changing his pick orders uh, in certain packs. Because if you have a guarantee that you're going to pick a card that is maybe you know like a half a grade uh, weaker than what is in the pack, but together with something synergistic will be better because it will make your deck more synergistic and especially in the heavily synergy driven formats, that's a very important thing. Um, it changes his evaluation. And I think that this is a skill that we are not really uh, using to its fullest. And today I'm going to be talking about probabilities of weeding certain cards. Um, so for example, um, one of the most basic examples of, um, uh, of that kind of uh, behavior is if you open a underpicked multicolor uncommon. And um, I think that an example from the previous set was the Bite Spawn Spider from um, Crimson Vow, I want to say. Yes, it was from Crimson Vow. Uh, the green blue 2 uh, 3 spider with uh, reach, you can uh, sacrifice it later in the game and you can create as many 1 1s as you have creatures in your graveyard. This card was very underpicked, and if I saw something in my um, um, first pick, together with the spider, I very often um, picked something that would go very well with the spider. I had my like a recipe for the deck, uh, and uh, uh, based on uh, my intuition and a lot of Sam Black's wisdom about it, and I floated the spider. If it came back to me. I knew that I'm uh, in the open lane and I can uh, basically draft that color because if no one picked the spider, it means no one is in the um, blue green. And that also means that if no one is in the blue green, probably I'll have a lot of cards that I can pick for free because no one else wants to play them uh, because they were only good when you were playing a blue green. And this is a strategy that I think is slightly underused in drafting. And I think that uh, some of the numbers that we're going to talk today about uh, are going to be useful if you want to start trying to do something like that. Right. So the data summary, um, I looked at the draft data from a best of one draft. Uh, I basically looked around 
12,000 drafts, uh, around 545,000 picks uh, to be analyzed. And obviously many, many more cards than that because, uh, well, each pick is based on X cards that are in the pack. So uh, quite a lot of data analysis for this one, uh, but I try to keep it to, you know, clear, clearly defined goals that we're going to talk about. And it's divided in two parts. Uh, so basically, I will talk about uh, wheeling for the first half of the seminar. Uh, and wheeling, of course, meaning uh, when the card returns to you from the pack that you've already seen. And the second part is going to be uh, how frequent you take a card. And it's basically um, looking at the data on when people see a card, what percentage of the time are they actually going to pick it? And obviously, you know, some cards are picked almost always and some cards are picked almost never if, if there's an option not to pick them and differences between those cards uh, can be quite interesting and also i'm looking at different skill uh, levels or at least win rate levels uh, among the players so i'm going to basically try to figure out is there a difference in uh, how frequently certain cards are picked and try to wonder why is the difference there but <clears throat> wheeling so there is always hope a card you didn't first pick will come back. But it doesn't necessarily need to be hope. We can put some precise numbers on uh, how often do cards wheel, or we can basically know that some cards are very, very unlikely to wheel or almost impossible that they will wheel in a reasonable pod and even in arena pod. Um, so we try to put some numbers on this hope uh, by looking at uh, which cards re wheel reliably and maybe which cards not only wheel reliably but also have pretty good win rate numbers uh, and uh, this way it's going to be a bit generalistic and a bit looking at um, what you can apply to every format and a bit specific to the um, uh, modern Hor uh, alchemy horizons Baldur's gate so first of all I spent way, way, way too much time making this slide, but um, these are the 23 cards that never wield in the data set. There was only 23 cards, and you will see that there are some really, really strong rares that uh, are not on this uh, slide, um, which means that they wield at some time and place uh, in the game. But uh, I think that quite interestingly, um, well, there's the five uh, ancient dragons, they never will. That is pretty reasonable because they are dragons and any kind of uh, skill level player likes dragons. Uh, there is one odd one, uh, Ancient Silver Dragon. I think we'll see it later um, that uh, evaluation of this card varies very widely between people that have a... Uh, yes, Josh, we know that the blue one should. And that, that actually in the data, you will see it very, very well that uh, uh, the blue one would wheel probably reliably if uh, you would have pods with only really good players with over 60% win rate. Um, Basilisk color, that's a colorless card and that's probably why it never wheels. Uh, actually numbers for that are a bit disappointing so it doesn't have a particularly high win rate but because it's colorless people pick it because it doesn't put them into any color and the card looks strong at least on paper. And then we have lots, lots of lots of bomby things. So uh, Champions of Tear, Chaos Baylor, Grim Hireling, Horn of Valhalla, Karlak. Uh, there's a bunch of specialized creatures. So there's Karlak, Clement, uh, Lazel, Lukamina, uh, um, Will, Wilson. Wilson! All of those things don't wheel. Um, Planeswalkers in Tasha and Minsk and Boo, they also never wheel. Um, oh yeah, Sh Shadowheart uh, uh, is also uh, one of the specialized creature. Then we have uh, the pantomime horse uh, of the format, the Hourglass Coven. Uh, that card is just busted and should not wheel, and indeed it didn't. And uh, a couple of really solid red cards in uh, Uthgard's Fury and Wrathful Red Dragon that also uh, never wheels. But these are the only 23 cards that uh, never wheeled. As you notice, all of them are either rare or mythic. So um, um, possibly if you would get a sample size as big as the uncommons have, some of them would just by chance um, manage to wield. But rares have um, um, rares have also another property in arena, and that's 
they generate gems. They increase your collection. If you pick enough rares, you're going to start getting gems for your drafters. So uh, um, uh, basically, that's one of the reasons why rares are not likely to win. And it's actually funny when you look at the um, data on when cards are being picked and uh, um, and when cards are being taken, that some of those really mediocre rares, uh, they start disappearing around, you know, like at pick six, pick seven. And I'm pretty sure that uh, in this format, I didn't have time to do that analysis. But um, by looking at those very medium rares that are clearly constructed plants, um, you can actually figure out how deep is the format. So basically, at what stage of the draft are you running out of cards that would be interesting for you as playables? And therefore, you're just going to pick a rare because mm, 20 gems, whatever, I'm just going to pick it. So I think that maybe somewhere in the future, I am going to do that analysis and try to basically um, compare multiple formats and see how mediocre rares disappear from those formats uh, based on the depth of the packs in terms of playables. And I think that in this format in particular, I did see some packs that are um, quite dry very quickly for me. Uh, maybe I picked the wrong lane in those drafts or something, but then I see next pack is still has decent cards for me. But I think that um, um, uh, this format is generally running out of um, playables faster than the previous ones. And I think that I had the first draft in ages when I was short on playables and I had to supplement myself with some random rubbish. Weirdly, I also trophied it and then some good decks didn't. So, you know, that's just magic, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, um, I, I see that the chat noticed that um, um, economy of arena is promoting rare drafting. And it's true that what Josh is saying in the chat that um, uh, random rares go much later on uh, Modo because there is no incentive of picking them because they are worthless. Well, here, every rare is worth the same 20 gems and therefore every rare is equally valuable for you because you will get those 20 gems and over time, you know, sacrificing those uh, marginal picks of cards that you are not going to be playing anyway uh, for 20 gems is a valid strategy. If you draft a lot, it will amount to, you know, you after a year of doing that, you will get a free draft out of it. So that's, that's pretty neat. Okay. So these were the 23 that don't wheel. So that means the rest will wheel to some extent. So how to use the 17 lines data to determine it? Um, well, first of all, you need to go into the uh, draft data from the public data sets, and then you can basically calculate it. Uh, and you do that by, if you have a card, say Blessed Hippogriff that I picked for this particular example, um, you look how many times do people see it as pick one independent of the pack, and then how many times do they see it in, as pick nine? independent of the pack. And if you have those two numbers, you basically can calculate, OK, I've seen it 1,000 times as a pick one. I've seen it uh, 50 times as a pick nine. Well, 50 divided by 1,000 will be something like 5%. So that card wheels 5% if it's a pick nine. And of course, the fact that um, uh, it should decrease. So um, uh, if you open a hippogriff, it will wheel 10% of the time. Mind this is uh, including the data from the early format. I'm pretty sure that right now it may be a bit less. But if you see the hippogriff in your pick two of a pack, you only get a 7.2% chance of wheeling. And then pick 11, so pick three to pick 11, it goes down to 5%. And pick four to pick 12, 3.8, and 2.1, and then Pick six to pick 14, it's only 0.6% of the time, which is still too much. You shouldn't see a Blessed Hippogriff as the last card, but it did happen, in fact, 0.6 time and that you've seen it in, uh, in the pick um, six. Um, now, important thing is that uh, dealing with this data is a bit painful. It's a massive file. Uh, there's a lot of data if you're not feeling good with pandas, it's hard to extract it. In Excel, it's uh, pretty advanced to get uh, all this data in right order to, um, to, to manage to get uh, to manage to get something useful out of it. But there are shortcuts. So um, 
for example, the blessed hippogriff has an alsa, which is the average last seen as, which you can just find on 17lands.com. You go into the card, um, um, into the card date statistics uh, tab, and you can see alsa of every single card. And alsa tells you basically when is the average last time you see it. Um, so in terms of hippogriff, you averagely see it last as 3.37 pick, but that means that you have like a broader distribution of when you see it. And uh, obviously the higher the ALSA number, the later you see the card, the bigger the chance of it winning, basically. Now, obviously some cards will have slightly different distributions on how those picks look like. So some cards will just slowly disappear over, um, uh, over every pick. And I think that one, one example of that was Baba Lisaga, which is, um, weird because it's a good card but it's also multicolor and it's not obvious and uh, you know you can see it people have seen it as a uh, pick 13 i can tell you from the data because uh, this was the first card alphabetically um in the set uh, at least in 17 lands alphabet because it has the arena mark before it so it slowly disappears so it disappears first fast because lots of them are going to be picked early in in in, in the drafts but then it just sort of stably uh, hangs on, and uh, you can see that it's quite late. And some cards will just sharply disappear, never to appear, and some cards will just like don't disappear in the beginning, then sharply disappear, uh, and then there will be anything. So uh, there's a couple of those shapes, but um, on average, you can actually link ALSA pretty well with um, uh, the chance of waiting, as I'm going to show you in a second. So just to go to the next card, it's Steadfast Paladin. And also of Steadfast Paladin is roughly one higher than of uh, Hippogriff. So you see it a whole pick later on average. But that whole pick later already um, account accounts to 24% uh, chance of wheeling it um, uh, if you opened it in your, uh, in your pack. Uh, and it's still 17% when you uh, have it as a second pick, when you've seen it as a second pick and you pass it forward. So, for example, if you open a, a pack with a Hippogriff and Paladin, I mean, you should probably still pick the Hippogriff because it's a better card. But if you're having doubts because for you, uh, Paladin is important because you were maybe in pack three and you're drafting some kind of life gain deck, um, there's still a case to be made to pick the Hippogriff and uh, the chance of wheeling the Paladin is, uh, well, two and a half times larger. So you give yourself a 25% chance if you open the Hippogriff that you pick the Hippogriff and you get the Paladin. Well, if you pick the Paladin, you give yourself only a 10% chance of uh, drafting two cards at the same time. So probabilistically, um, a Steady Paladin uh, is, uh, Stephas Paladin is a better thing to uh, float and hope to get back because 25% is not nothing. It will happen one in four drafts that you're going to get it back. In pack three, you should sort of have the feeling on how open white might be in your pod. And um, if you feel that it's quite open, you can actually risk it. And probably that chance of wheeling it is, is, is higher than those 24%. That is if you identify your pod well and if you understood the signals. Um, here we have... Um, Cradle of Baldur's Gate. Now this card is slightly different um, because it has a higher ALSA because there is the heuristic of not drafting multicolor cards early. It is a heuristic that I think is maybe overused in my private opinion. I think that people should be more adventurous in picking multicolor cards um, uh, earlier. But Cradle is also not so great, and the color combination of blue, green, uh, blue, blue, black is not so great that um, that you should pick it early in this format. So it has a higher ALSA, but it wheels, but it, the increase in wheeling. Um, Elkar, no problem. Uh, is asking, uh, excuse me, what what does ALSA mean? Uh, ALSA means average last seen as. So uh, extreme example is. If a card would be so good that by drafting it, you would win uh, a game, it would be always first pick. So you would only see it when you open it because no one would pass it to you. So also that card would be one. If uh, a card is sometimes passed further, that also increases. If the card almost always is being passed, 
Alsa goes up to something like eight or nine, um, uh, and that means that the card is absolutely not wanted by anyone. So uh, uh, that is what Alsa is. Right, let's remove it. Um, so Cradle, you can wheel 33% of the time when you open. So if, again, you're in the pack three situation and you have um, a green bounty, but Cradle will be great for your deck, you can float it and you will have a decent chance of uh, winning it. When with Green Bounty, especially in pack three, when people that don't have removal will just hang on to anything because they think, oh my God, where's my removal? I need something. The chance of winning um, um, Green Bounty is pretty low. So uh, floating Cradle is again, putting this 33% and probably higher if you know that blue black is open as, as it should be if you're drafting it. Um, chance of wheeling it is, is quite high. So basically again, by floating cradle and hoping that it will uh, wheel, you are giving yourself a decent chance of drafting two cards with your uh, first pick from the third pack. And of course, as with previous ones, that chance of wheeling it is decreasing um, uh, as packs picks go later. But you know, twenty nine percent, twenty five percent. If you have it as a third pick and um, and you try to wheel it, is pretty impressive. Still, it's still as good as um, um, uh, as um, um, as the paladin uh, on pick nine. So uh, uh, it has a decent chance of being wheeled. Uh, and again, yeah, this one has a one higher alsa than the previous two ones. I try to make it so that the alsa progresses by by one each time. Um, so next we have uh, Soul Knife Spy with 6.41 Alsa, and this already wheels 50% of the time. So say there is a deck that is uh, interesting to uh, build around. Maybe you have a choice between Cradle and uh, Soul Knife Spy. You might want to pick the Cradle and try to wheel the Soul Knife Spy, and you have like this synergistic package of uh, a card that maybe one day will draw your card, and a card that uh, is a one three four two mana. So um, an amazing combo, but. When we're looking at Alsa of six, we are already getting into this um, mid forties, uh, fifty percent uh, chance of wheeling when you open the card, and that's quite a lot. That's basically if you want that card, you want to float it, you give yourself fifty percent chance of drafting two cards with one pick, which is amazing because that's how your deck becomes much better. Um, and the last example, uh, Earth Cult Elemental, that has Alsa of seven point two. And this card wheels 70% of the time uh, when you open it. So you are, first of all, quite likely to wheel it. Second of all, if you don't, that is a very strong signal for you that there is something going on that someone is trying to do similar things that you do. Because Earth Cult Elemental is a great card. It has actually a pretty high win rate, uh, but it goes into a very specific deck. So um, if someone else on the pod is drafting that deck, um, floating it and not getting it back might be a signal that maybe you should reevaluate your draft strategy and, and um, uh, pivot to something else. Obviously, it can be just that someone likes elementals and they picked it for no reason. Um, but, um, well, what can you do about it? Um, so I told you that um, there is a relationship between ALSA and the probability of winning a card. So here we have a graph where we have an axis uh, with ALSA and axis with probability of winning. There's lots of chaos in the early days, but uh, uh, at around ALSA 0.6 uh, of, of six, uh, the wheeling probability starts going super linearly. I think that here it becomes like slightly flatter and at six there is this infraction, inflection point when, when wheeling becomes just proportionately higher with uh, each uh, number. Because of that, I think um, that you should dynamically use the uh, skill of uh, being able to predict the wheeling frequency. I think that cards with ALSA with of five and less are probably only useful for wheeling when it's pick one or pick two. So when you will see them again in pick nine and pick 10. Um, and before that, uh, it becomes quite risky to wheel something unless unless it's late in the draft and you might have an idea that, oh, this is one of those pods when something should be open, therefore I can float it and it may be coming back to me. But I think that 
picks nine and ten, you can do it from L cell five, and you will have uh, respectively around uh, you know thirty five percent chance of wheeling for uh, pick nine, and maybe twenty five percent chance of wheeling um, at the pick of uh, uh, pick ten. So roughly, you give yourself a quarter of those cards, and they have to have L cell five or higher. Um, and then for later things, uh, you might want to go with higher ALSA cards. So uh, these are the ones that you probably want to uh, float. ALSA, apart from telling you how late the card goes, tells you something about the preferences of the community. And it's very worth, in general, to look at the cards that have a high win rate and high ALSA, because that means these are the cards that you may reliably build your plan around because people are not interested in drafting them. And also, if you don't manage to wield them, you know that someone else is doing that. So you sort of generate your own probing signal by floating it and seeing if it comes back, especially in pack one, you can actually have an idea of what's going on in the draft and, and, and using it in a strategical way to, to, to know if, um, if, if, if the plan is valid for this particular one. And I think that this is what happened in formats when there were common build rounds and um, um, oh, you have to go really, really far in time when I didn't play, but uh, maybe Josh, is, if, 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 if he's there still. What was the blue one two that cannot be blocked from uh, Amonkhet, was it? It was Amonkhet, I'm pretty sure. Uh, Slither Blade or something like that. Um, I think that that card had the deck built around it with, uh, with, with tricks, cartouches, and the unblockability and tempo cards. And you could float that card if it came back, then you were basically, um, yeah, it is Slither Blade, yes. Um, so basically, you could float it if it came back. You knew that the deck should be open because if someone was interested in the Slither Blade deck, they would have picked it. Um, and therefore, you were on an archetype that used a completely different pick order, which is a very useful thing in draft because. If you have a different pick order than the rest of the pod, you can actually pick good cards early and float all the bad cards because no one is interested in them, but you are. So um, uh, you get a much higher chance of, of getting their own playables and, and, and making a deck that's functioning uh, because you are interested in cards that... Uh... Um, um, yeah. Armoric is making a good point that this strategy only worked because it was before data. And once the secret was out on the Pro Tour, people went overboard and trying to force it, and it was unplayable. And this is the great part of data, that it gives information to everyone. But I'm still thinking that um, now, even with the amount of data that there is, if there was a build around that would be very successful, uh, it would be hard to uh, distinguish it from the data. Um, and it would still require other ways of gathering knowledge because especially with build arounds that a percentage of people, a small percentage of people play, um, it's not going to show in the generic data, which most people look at. So because of that, sometimes those build arounds are quite well hidden. And I think that uh, especially like Ikoria was that, that's, that's why I love the format. There were so many build arounds in that format, so many niche pockets of synergy that you could draft and change your... Um, pick order and uh, position yourself well in the draft because you were drafting something else than everyone else was doing. And I think other examples of that was trying to make the green, red, maybe team or spells deck in Midnight Hunt when you started with like something like Seize the Storm and you were on a different pick order than the rest of the people and you were picking cards that they were not interested and they were extremely good for you. When you're in that situation, if you're the only person doing it in the pod, and that's very an important caveat there, uh, you are playing a different game, you're benefiting from quite a lot because um, uh, draft is a weird format in the way that if everyone tries to do the same, everyone is a loser. If um, one person does something differently, they can benefit quite uh, amazingly. And I think I've seen that in the discussion about drafting the hard way versus forcing. So if everyone in the format is forcing, um, well, Drafting the hard way is a perfect strategy. If everyone is drafting the hard way, forcing is actually good because you are forcing them to not be in your colors because they are drafting the hard way and you're sending strong signals that something is cut. So uh, this is the same thing. 
if you have a different pick order than anyone else, you're benefiting because uh, cars that they don't evaluate highly, you're going to get late and they are going to be very good for you if the archetype that you're drafting is good. Um, but yeah, I think that this graph, and I will try to put it on my Facebook feed as well so that you have access to it, is pretty useful in terms of like, you know, uh, I don't want to use the rule of thumb because it's an awful expression, but as a sort of uh, guideline for you on what percentage of uh, wheeling will happen depending on the alpha of the car, depending on uh, where do you see it in the draft. It might be a bit awkward to uh, to you know like use it, but if you roughly know which cards you might want to expect wheeling and which cards would be interesting to wheel because not all of them you literally want to wheel, um, uh, you can use that as a useful tool to, to sort of memorize, you know, 10, 15 cards in the format that you might be interesting in winning. Uh, and it, I think that um, these curves with maybe some minor adjustments depending on the lands in the, in the, uh, in the booster or not, it will be pretty universal. I think that the, the link between ALSA and the probability of wheeling, I didn't check it on other uh, formats, but this should be pretty universal. So you could, um, you know, we're talking about um, uh, Alchemy Horizons now. Um, but, um, um, but I think that in Dominaria United, you should have more or less the same number. So, you know, you can still think that pick one, pick two, ALSA five, that can wheel quarter of the time, 30% of the time. Um, ALSA six, uh, that will go up to 45, 50% uh, of wheeling. Hi, Aviseras. Glad that you made it finally. That's good that uh, I'm suggested by Twitch also. Um, okay. So I picked the 15 highest win rate cards that wheel at least 30% of the time. Um, just to uh, give you an impression, what cards are we talking about here? Um, and the highest win rate card that wheels reliably is Steadfast Unicorn. I think that it's drying out right now and probably you should update yourself with the um, uh, newest numbers. I based it on the whole duration of the season, but actually this is super easy because again, you can go back to this graph and if in the whole format, uh, Steadfast Unicorn has a 6.2 ALSA, I'm saying from memory, probably it's some, it actually might be something like around six. Um, if right now it's at five, you can just basically move it down on this curve and say, oh, well, then probably now it's only wheeling 40% of the time, which is still enough. So, uh, so that's good. So uh, basically, if you have those numbers from the whole format, you can actually look at the ALSA and the recent time and, and adjust it basically if the card went up in evaluation as it should, if it wheels and has a high win rate, then you can, um, uh, then you can use this, uh, this graph uh, uh, to, to basically be able to calculate uh, how frequently things wheel. Um, then we have Flaming Fist Dust Guard, a good white two drop uh, that wheels around one third of the time, 59.5% win rate. Nothing to be ashamed of uh, as a common. Uh, Vampire Spawn wheels 38% of the time. It's the disgusting, never should happen, but does. Um, and it has 59% of the 59% uh, win rate. Uh, Soldiers of the Watch, the uh, double team creature, um, wheels again roughly a third of the time. Uh, Heal Gen Head Gorger, 45% of the time it wheels. Now, there is a good reason for that. Uh, Again, another heuristic that I think you can easily break in this format is that, well, you shouldn't have more than two, three, six drops. So people don't want to overload on the six drops. I've been playing decks in this format with six, seven, six drops. I just had a lot of ramp and land fixing uh, in one way or another, and maybe even some reanimation. So I do like to play my decks with the circle of the land druid, the thing that mills four cards. And, um, uh, and when it dies, uh, it basically brings back a land from graveyard to your hand because it doesn't ramp you, but it does make you not run out of uh, land place. The one, one body, I think blocks the three ones very well. And um, I don't know why, but I face a lot of three ones. So it can stand there and stop uh, your opponent from attacking and eventually will get you a land. And the mill, if I have some reanimation can lead me to uh, playing like a turn four uh, 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 Dread Linerm, uh, which is a problem for many decks. There is one random gate in there that wheels 33 times. I don't even know which one. That's the red one, I guess. 
um, sepulchre gold wheels 40% of the time. And this is a weird one because this is a card that is actually going to appear in the, one of the most taken cards. So it seems to me that there is a massive uh, difference in evaluation of sepulchre gold by the 17 lens users and the non-17 lens users. It's a big difference there. Uh, so it wheels 40% of the time uh, and has a good win rate. Uh, you hear something on watch uh, that also similar win rate, similar uh, wheeling strat tech, uh, wheeling uh, numbers around 40%. Deadly dispute wheels 30% of the time. Never happens to me because I try to wheel it routinely, but it never comes back. So um, uh, uh, still 57.6% win rate, pretty good. Uh, that's all, by the way, the win rates are all game in hand win rate. Uh, so that's the one when you drew the card at any stage of the game an opening hand or later. Then there's a really nice card uh, that I found to be absolutely crucial for my ramp decks, uh, Arcane Archery. Uh, that's the trick that gives plus three, plus three, uh, Reach and Trample. And it also, the next creature you cast will get plus one, plus one counter and um, uh, Reach and Trample, which is amazing for things like uh, Hill Giant Headquarter, because this as an eight, seven with Trample, is much better than this as a 7-6 without. You can't chump it to eternity with 1-1s. One and this card wheels 60% of the time. So if you open it, if, even if you get like pick 3-4, I'm pretty sure you can wheel it. Uh, and you probably want one in your deck. So you can plan when you're going to take it. So you don't have to waste early picks on getting the card, basically. And then we have another um, uh, uh, two drop with double team and Genasi Rabble Rouser that wheels 34% of the time. And I don't have a good explanation why that happens. Uh, it might be linked to the early data if the ALSA of uh, Genasi Rebel Rouser dropped, which I think it did. Um, that number can be slightly lower now, but it's pretty sure that you still wheel it 20-25% of the time, which is quite a lot. And then we have Devoted Paladin, which is if you if you want it, if you have like a go wide plan with um, Devoted Paladin being a nice top end for it, you know you can wheel it, so you can focus on your little things. And the devoted paladin will appear somewhere later in your uh, in your deck, and you you know if it's if it's open on the pod, very good chance you're going to have it uh, if you need it. So that's why you know cards like devoted paladins are good to be incorporated in your plans because you have an almost a guarantee that you're going to be able to have them. Uh, because even if you open them early and you don't want to waste an early pick, reliably you can wield them. And then Valiant Farewell, another trick, 65% uh, uh, chance of wheeling and still a decent 57% win rate. Uh, Monk of the Open Hand, that's, um, I think, the only uncommon. Oh, no, there's a Gate of the Citadel. But one of the few uncommons on that list. Um, I think that also uh, people started realizing that the Monk is better in this format than in the previous one because white is more aggressive. Um, so that number might have gone down, but still for around 40% chance of wheeling. And I already talked about Earth Cult Elemental, 70% chance of winning. Another great card to incorporate in your plan. Um, I like to play Earth Cult Elementals in red, black with heavy treasure synergies. And I'm not even talking about treasure synergies, but with lots of treasure generation. You know, if I have something like two Shambling Gusts and a Deadly Dispute, uh, I can play the Earth Cult Elemental quite early, and it's going to be problematic for the opponent to deal with the 6-6. Six -six. Uh, especially if they are forced to sacrifice some permanents. So, uh, yeah, well, they will always be forced. If you hit not 20, that's sometimes game set match. Okay, so this is the part about wheeling. Uh, hopefully, uh, from it, you can uh, mainly take away this graph that lets you sort of estimate what are the odds of wheeling a card just by looking at the ALSA value from the table in 17 lands rather than doing all the tedious work that I did to get those numbers. Thank you very much. Seven hours just to get the data out in the proper format. Um, so that you don't have to. Um, and as I said, I'm going to put this graph on my Twitter feed tomorrow somewhere. Uh, maybe I want to sp sp split it into different picks so that you can actually have a useful tool uh, for estimating the chance of wheeling a card based on as ALSA. Okay, now I talk about snap picking, and uh, it's not only about snap picking, it's generally about taking the cards. Um, I think that the idea for this came to me from me. Uh, like 
every time I do a crack a pack uh, style of analysis uh, in uh, other podcasts when I'm sometimes guesting. Uh, I'm not gonna uh, say a name, but starts with limited ends with resources. But I also do that in limited edition or uh, you know, J2S Josh's thing, whatever it's called, something about alligators. Um, whenever I do that, I very often will talk about card and I said, I think that this card is good, but this is too early for me to pick it. And um, I use that as a sort of bon mot, as a sort of thing to say. I think it's pretty understandable what I mean by that. But I think that this is another thing that um, we can actually put numbers to. Um, I have all the data and, um, when people saw a particular card, and I can also have the data when they pick a particular card. And if I have those two numbers, I can calculate what was the percentage of people picking particular cards. Um, and yeah. Um, Based on that data, I started an analysis. And I think I'm going to continue with it because I didn't complete it. I looked at the general view of uh, picking, but I also have the data that uh, looks at how late or how early is it optimal to pick particular cards. And I, I unfortunately didn't have uh, time or uh, idea how to visualize it well. But there is a good idea of uh, looking how frequently people pick cards and, and why would that be so? And, and also, um, once you do that, you can actually divide people into the win rate brackets. I'm not willing to use the term ability brackets because win rate is not necessarily one-to-one uh, -one linked with uh, ability, but there is a correlation between uh, win rate and uh, ability to play the game So and, and draft, so uh, that there is, there is some connection in there. So... Um, these are the cards that are picked almost always. And by almost, I mean, it's between 85 and 70% of the time that they are picked. And um, you will see that uh, every single card on that list, double checking, yes, is either a rare or a mythic. Actually, most of those cards are the cards that we've seen several slides ago. Yes, I spent so much effort on making that slide. I'm going to come back to it. Uh, these are mostly the cards that never wheel. Well, they never wheel because they are almost always picked. And if they are almost always picked, the chance of them going far in draft are, uh, well, almost zero. So we have Champions of Terror, we have Tasha, we have Lazel, we have Ancient Gold Dragon, Minsk and Boo, Brass Dragon, Hourglass Coven, Lucamina, Basilisk Collar, Chaos Bailer, Clement, Wrathful Red Dragon, Ancient Copper Dragon, Will Pact Bound Duelist, and Grim Hireling. So that's 15 cards, and all 15 are in those 23 cards that never wheel. So um, uh, th there's the you know quite an obvious conclusion. Really good high rarity cards are going to be picked by a 79th user quite highly. Uh, now probably some of the cards on that list of 23, and that includes the blue ancient dragon, are not very highly picked by the 17 lens users. They're still going to be picked because they're a mythic and a mythic is a mythic. Um, so I think that the blue dragon is picked roughly 20% of the time by people um, by people from the uh, over 60% win rate bracket that I did. But I'm sure that it's much higher in the general population because A, appeal of the dragon, B, uh, lots of people play to build their constructed collections and getting mythics is good for them because they might get, uh, you know, uh, vault progress, 40 gems, whatever. Uh, or maybe they like playing dragons because they have a dragon brawl deck or something. Um, but I think that most of those cards are not only um, high rarity, but also very good. We have some of the biggest bombs in, uh, in the format with uh, Lazel, uh, Hourglass Coven, Lucamina, these are Clemens. Uh, these are like really the, the pinnacle of the win rate. Our champions of tear, obviously, um, at Misk and Boo. These are the cards that are the pinnacle of the format in terms of um, in terms of win rate. But because of that, they're also pretty much boring to uh, analyze in depth. Because yeah, we know bombs are good. They have big bombs. Yeah, that's my brilliant device. If that would be any everything that I was uh, that I had to say in the topic, probably. Um, probably I would recommend you not to listen to me, actually. 
but it's good to know what are those numbers because then you can sort of um, uh, try thinking about uh, how often you should not draft particular cards. You know, 14% of the time someone passed Champions of Terror because it's a two white mana card. If you open it in pack three and you're nowhere near playing uh, white and you don't have fixing at that stage, probably you should just ship it unless you need it for constructed for some reason and move on with your life and draft uh, a really good uncommon from uh, the colors that you actually are playing. Maybe there's some like red, maybe there's the Mephit's Enthusiasm. Just, just pick it over Champions of Tear. You shouldn't be stuck in picking it because it's a Chase Mythic. Uh, sometimes you have to let go, but I probably would not recommend passing it if you see it in the first pack because then you don't have a burden of previous cards. You can do whatever you want, pick the strongest, basically. Um, but yeah, with, with this order, we, you can sort of see that uh, de decrease in priority. Um, uh, although I think Grim Hireling is just such a busted card, I would always pick it. There's always space for a one green, one black mana card in your deck. So what is more important to look at are the most picked commons. And there's three of them that are head and shoulders above the rest. Uh, Priest of Ancient Lore, Grim Bounty and Dragonfire. They are all picked roughly 40% of the time that 17 lands users see them. These are the cards that are picked higher in general. So not only they're picked 40% of the time, but they're also picked mostly in the first five picks or so because they don't go much further than that. And then we have a big drop of 10 percentage point and we have the sort of good solid commons that maybe don't need to be so prioritized because they are not so much um, um, valued by the community. So we have Owlbear, uh, sewer Plague, Gilson Plow Prowler, Blessed Hippogriff, Pilgrim's Eye, uh, Underseller Myconid, Patriarch's Humiliation, Sepulchre Ghoul. Remember, this is the card that wheels 40% of the time. And still, 17 lens user pick it around 22% of the time they see it, which means that maybe they are even too aggressive in picking their Sepulchre Ghouls. Maybe they can, uh, you know, try to float them. Um, uh, uh, and try to wield them. Uh, Sisyphus 33 is really surprised that the Hippogriff is uh, not in the snap pick pool. I I am not because this data contains also the data from the first days and there was no consensus on it being the uh, best white common or uh, among the couple of best white commons in, in that time. And I think that it changed quite well, maybe not dramatically, but it changed somewhat. If you would look at the um, at the newer data, unfortunately, I have like a whole bunch of data. I didn't, I couldn't properly sort it and, and look at the sub um, uh, sub time categories on that. But I have my suspicions that uh, blessed hippogriff has to be picked much higher if you want to play with it, and you want to play with it more than you did in the beginning of the format. So that that number might have gone up. Um, and then we have Pilgrim's Eye, Underseller Myconid, Patriarch Humiliation. Now, think of those that if you are in those colors, you will pick those cards quite heavily because they, these are the absolute um, key cards to the, to the archetypes that they are in. We have Hobgoblin Captain, which maybe, maybe is picked a bit too much uh, based on what it delivers. This format is much richer in free one creatures. The pack tactics is not as um, uh, predominant, so maybe maybe this card is a bit, you know, blast from the past, and people are picking it because they remember how good it was in the AFR. But uh, maybe its time has uh, passed uh, since then. And we have Vampire Spawn, Steadfast Paladin, Dead Dispute. Like bunch of those cards are actually from um, uh, from the previous set. So we have the Priest, Grim Bounty, Dragon's Lore, uh, Owl Bear. Uh, uh captain spawn paladin and dispute so there's there some of those cards might have carry a historic um meaning for people because they played with them before they remember how good they were in the previous format and therefore they pick them uh but there's a bunch of newcomers there as well so um it's not only the old cards uh that are heavily picked now in terms of uncommons Thank you very much for putting a special U in the name, uh, Watsi. It's always a pleasure to have special symbols. So therefore, Rasad Monk of Cell, uh, square root of A, N, E, um, is the most picked uncommon. Uh, it probably was supposed to be Saloon with the U with the double accent on top of it, but um, 
Uh, turns out that uh, my computer does not recognize that symbol, or uh, maybe 17 lines data does, but I don't because in HTML might be differently coded. But it's picked 50% of the time it's seen. So uh, when we go back to rares, you see that in the list of 15 rares, the lowest one was 69%, uh, which is nice. Um, but that means that there is a big gap between how snap picky are the rares and how snap picky are the uncommons. Um, don't get me wrong, Rasad will not wheel. So there is no point of uh, picking a rare over Rasad and hoping it will wheel because that doesn't happen. I mean, it did happen. I think per 12,000 drafts, it happened uh, 12 times that Rasad wheeled. But we also know that there are rares that are having quite a high power uh, level and maybe later in the game you don't want to pick Rasad. I think that it should be probably picked slightly higher. I think that the card is strong enough to be better than most of the rares. And um, and I'm, 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 I'm sure I could find the rares in this list that I would pick Rasad over. Like Basilisk Color, for example, I would probably pick Rasad over it. Um, I mean, depending on the situation, maybe Tasha or um, Chaos Baylor, I mean, uh, or one of the ancient dragons. I, I think that I would be happy to pick Rasad over those cards in some situations. And then we have um, a bunch of cards around 45. So we have Cast Down, Sculport Merger, the Viconia, Sea Tower Imprisonment, Method Enthusiasm. Um, so, uh, bunch of removal free removal spells and uh, and two really val value creatures in sculpture mentioned and viconia um viconia is the specialized creature if you don't remember the two mana two three that can exile cards from the graveyard and when it's specialized it, it brings back one of the exiled creatures um, into your hand it conjures a copy of it into your hand uh, pom, 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 pom. What do we have uh, later? Battle Cry Goblin, Lulu, Forgetful, Holy Fan. These are the cards that you know will be picked at around forty percent of the time. So, Battle Cry Goblin, Lulu, Ambergris, Black, uh, and Ambergris are sort of on the level of top commons in terms of uh, how uh, aggressively they are picked by the seventy nine users. Um, yeah, I think that Battle Cry Goblin, uh, Procobrito, um, uh, noticed it very well. Um, <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> uh, Battle Cry Goblin is part of the nostalgia trip to um, to the uh, older format. And I think that it's still good, Skullport Merchant, don't get me wrong. But I think that Skullport Merchant is notably weaker in this format than it was in the previous one. And one of the reasons is that there is always the Patriot's blessing that hangs around it. Even if it doesn't kill it, it just turns into the useless uh, one four. Um, uh, so, um, you know, you can deal with it for one mana. And that's pretty annoying. And then we have like a bunch of cards with a, um, around 30%. So uh, these are the cards that are as good as, you know, uh, as highly picked as the owl bears and the sewer plagues and the guilt world prowlers. Uh, and we have their um black dragon servok the usurper scanos dragon vassal i think that this card is overvalued in general i don't think it's that good um it will win some games but a lot of the time it's just a do nothing um honestly and we have jahiro which on the other hand is amazing and much better than scanos prosperous innkeeper and gut fanatical priestess which also I think is an overrated card. It's just like six mana for a four three is way too much, even if there's this fight. And it will have scenarios, it will have its moment. But nonetheless, these are the cards that are snap picked. But of course, it would be nice to look at how people pick cards from a slightly uh, nuanced angle. And those big average data sets, um, they show you something, but they don't show you many things. So, um, uh, in order to figure it out, how does the skill play into that? How does your win rate, which is correlated with skill, let's be honest about it. And it, it's not that when you have a win rate of 60, you're a good player. And when you have a win rate of 55, you're not a good player. It's just, there is probably a better chance that within the whole 
cohort of 60 uh, percent plus uh, players you will have an average slightly higher skill level so that's the assumption i'm basing everything on so never assign your own ability in the game to the win rate currently um but uh, i think that if you look at larger populations there will be a, a solid correlation between win rate and skill uh, because you have so many players to compare um okay so i divided players into three cohorts because the we like even numbers uh players with under 50 percent win rate uh with 50 to 60 percent win rate and over the 60 percent win rate no uh that's not the official cut of sisyphus is asking is that the 17 lands uh, 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 top players uh, list? It's not, because unfortunately, due to the uh, protection of, well, I mean, not unfortunate, I think it's very fortunate that 17 lands protects the uh, player's identity. Uh, and, you know, if I got data that says this is a top player, this is a not pl top player, were I a bad person, I could figure out who is in which bracket. And no one wants that, uh, so I don't get the data with the num with the brackets on it right now uh, because it will be too easy to identify someone. You know, uh, say um, uh, Cord calls tweets one of his trophy decks. I go there. I look if I find an exact list like that in the data. I look at the uh, denominator of that player. Oh, I see that he's top. Obviously, he is. Um, and then I can say something. Well, in, in the case of Court of Calls, nothing wrong because we know that he's in that top bracket for sure. But um, in case of someone that's maybe not in the top bracket, and if they share things, and if, the, if you figure out that they're not in the top bracket and you write about it, it would be awkward. So because of that, 17 Lands made it sure that no one, except for people that are literally um, uh, um, involved in coding the top bracket, which I'm not, I'm just a collaborator. Um, no one has access to that data, so you can't really like uh, take it out of it. So because of that, if I analyze the big data from the uh, big files, I have to make my own workarounds. So this will not correspond to the top players, um, although there will be a major overlap, I think, between them, because if you divide the win rates like this, you get uh, reasonably even uh, sample sizes, so I think. It makes sense. I knew it from previous format because obviously I started doing it on my own before the top, medium, and bottom uh, tiers were available. Uh, right. So no, these are not the top, but probably they are quite close to that in, in a way. Also, the top um, uh, players and the um, medium and bottom player brackets, they are not only based on one format because, as I said, you can have a bad format. I mean, I usually have my win rate around 62%, but uh, I had formats when I just couldn't crack 55 because it just didn't agree with me, the format. Now, obviously, I would not be in a top bracket if it was only based on one format, but if you base it on three, the chance of me hitting two formats that I, I don't feel comfortable with um, is pretty low. Therefore, you know, um, I will be put still in the data of people that know something because uh, I clearly have the win rate to uh, to show it, but maybe not in this format. So, if I if I screw up multiple times in the formats, uh, well, then it will reflect in the numbers. So, um, looking at those three brackets, hopefully, can tell us something. And uh, uh, let, let let let's look at data because I'm blabbing already. It's late. I'm tired. So, in this analysis, I looked at the delta between uh, two groups of players and tried to figure out. What does it mean, and why are those cards having so big, such a big delta? And this is the delta and picking. So, if you look at this uh, graph, we have the delta between top and bottom players, and its uh, first card on the list is Hourglass Coven, and the delta is twenty-two point six percentage points. Now it says percent, but it actually is percentage points. So, what does it mean? Is that um, independently of what percentage of the time uh, bottom players uh, pick our glass coven? Uh, the top players pick it 22 percentage points more frequently. So if the bottom players pick it 50 percent of the time when they see it, uh, top players will pick it 72 percent of the time when they see it. 
which means that um, Hourglass Coven is much more valued by the top players. Um, they will pick it even if maybe they are not in the colors because the card is super busted. Um, and you will see that's one of the reasons. Second, it might be that people that are in the top bracket play black more. Because if you play black more, you will naturally pick more Hourglass Covens. And I think it's always the mixture of those two. I think that top players evaluate super busted cards differently and they will go out of the way to play them because they know that this one card can win them the whole game. Uh, but also top players in best of one arena at least are the people who are much more likely to be drafting with preference. So they will not force color maybe, but they will bias themselves towards particular colors. And I think black is one of those colors. White will be the other color um, in this format that top players will play more frequently than other groups. And I think that you can see that if you look at the uh, 17 lens data and you look at the top, middle and uh, bottom brackets. Uh, but yeah, we have the Hourglass Coven as the top card. Uh, J2S Josh also says pick Hourglass Coven as a pro tip. This card is just super busted. Um, you know, six mana, nine, nine over three bodies with abilities and possibility of blinking, reanimating, whatever. It's, there's a lot you can do with this card. Uh, then we have um, Shadowheart uh, Sharan Cleric, and that's 16 percentage point uh, more picked by the um, uh, 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 by the uh, top win rate uh, players. And we have a bunch of cards around that 16 percentage, 15 percentage points. We have Skullport Merchant, Sea Tower Imprisonment. These are two uncommons. And that are way highly more highly picked by the uh, top bracket, and that's um, uh, I think that is something to do with um, uh, evaluation of the bottom win rate players rather than the preference of the top uh, win rate players. I think that Skullport Merchant is not an obvious card that is busted. Uh, and maybe Sea Tower Imprisonment. It looks very much like all the other versions of um, uh, pacifism. It's way better than that. And I think that top players will instantly know that, but maybe the people who are still beginning to learn um, um, limited might not see it yet. So these are the two cards that I would uh, draw your attention to, but to think th these cards, learn how to evaluate them, learn how to learn about them, and think why those cards are so good. Uh, then we have a couple of other bombs. We have a Will Pack Bound Duelist. Um, and that card is 15% times more, uh, 15 percentage point more picked by the top group. Intellect Devourer is an interesting one. Uh, I think that this card is underrated both by the top and the middle bracket, uh, bottom and the middle bracket compared to the top. Uh, it has something to appeal to the, the uh, to a more skilled uh, group of players. And this even might be linked to. Um, Uh, Aviseras is sorry. I'm 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 having a question from the from the chat. Um, is there a good place to check out these graphs side by side uh, to browse in tandem with the VOD? Unfortunately, the, these graphs I just make them based on the uh, publicly available. Well, not yet publicly available technically, but uh, soon to be publicly available data uh, from uh, Seventeen Lens. So they are not on the website. I do all these analyses separately and. Um, um, and basically, um, they're only here. So yeah, sorry. Uh, this is uh, I, I I select what I show, and uh, over time the data will be available. But still, to get from the data to the graphs, it requires a bit of work. But um, uh, uh, if you smile to me, I can send you the some sort of Excel file with the numbers. So uh, yeah. Um, Okay, um, so going back, uh, I think Intellect Devourer is a particularly... Um, uh, so Sisyphus, I have um, a YouTube channel when you can see the replay of that, basically. There is a version of it in the podcast um, form. I started writing articles for mtgazone.com um, that will contain parts of that. Um, but I don't, have, um, I don't have a place where I store raw data files. I am thinking about doing that as part of a Patreon, but uh, that will not come until hopefully later this year. So um, uh, that might be something that will happen. Basically, I will put some data and 
Yes, MGA zone. Thank you very much, J2S Josh. Um, so yeah, I think Intellect Devourer is a particularly appealing to uh, um, uh, high win rate players because I think that this card, except for you, Josh, he just says that limited writers for MTGA zone are amazing. Wait, if it's except for you, then it's basically me and I keep. Yeah, amazing, guys. Amazing, guys. Um, int. So <laughs> trying to come back to, trying to come back to, yeah, Avicera, so you can catch up. There's like, there, I think that there is probably like good 10 seminars that treat on to general topics that might be worth, worth, uh, worth rewatching. The one about signals, things about mulliganing. I try to make several episodes, uh, every format that use the examples of the cards from the particular format, but can be applied more generally uh, to other formats. So things about speed of the format, uh, how to analyze that, wheeling, signal reading, card evaluation, uh, all that kind of stuff is um, pretty much general, but uses examples of the current set that I recorded it in. Um, <clears throat> OK. Intellect Devourer is a card that uh, Devourer is a card that particularly apply, uh, uh, appeals to players with a high win rate because uh, it requires some finicky play, uh, it requires some cunning uh, uh, planning and strategy, and I think because of that they will pick it higher because maybe uh, players with a slightly you know uh, lower ability um, will not be able to utilize the full potential of it. So I think that might be why this card is present there. Um, there is no excuse why Luca Mina is uh, and not evaluated as highly as uh, by the top players by the rest of the group or Horn of Valhalla. I think that those cards are uh, in particular, um, you know, raw power. They should be quite apparent that they are really strong. Um, and in case of Luca Mina, splashable easily. If I play anything black or anything red and I have a couple of treasures lying around, why wouldn't you play Luca Mina then? Um, now, the interesting card for me is Suna's Intervention, and that's um, a card that does a lot of things, including gaining life, making some weird creature, and or two creatures, actually, destroying something. So it's it's basically like the, uh, what was the card from N21? Uh, Sublime Epiphany, but in white, in, sort, in a way. You can pick many options, and, and all of them are useful. I think that the power of this card escapes maybe uh, beginner players and uh, experienced players know that having those many modes um, and being able to use them flexibly while at its lowest it's uh, make two two twos and um, uh, and uh, gain some life uh, which is a good floor um, that that card is super powerful i think that that power escapes players that are maybe less invested or uh, at early stage of their magic adventures uh, priest of ancient lore i think that um this card 12 percentage points higher drafted by the top players i think that this is related to um um not only the power of the card itself but also to the preference of white and i think priest of ancient lore is going early it's a super powerful card and that's why uh experienced players will pick it higher because they know that they won't have a chance of seeing it later and similar thing viconia i think um uh, is more powerful uh in the hands of better players i don't have numbers for that that can be arranged actually we could have the numbers on that just by looking at 17 lands nowadays um methods enthusiasm another super powerful card that maybe uh, people will uh, under evaluate although it's strange because normally 17 lands users value removal higher than uh, general population on arena values removal higher than 17 lands users but i think that maybe this format is not typical in the way that um, removal is much stronger here. And also method enthusiasm is a, a bit of a confusing wording. Maybe people don't understand the full power of that card. It's amazingly powerful when you think about it. Um, again, Guilds were Prowler. You need to know that uh, drawing a card is the strongest ability ever printed on a card um, to know that it's good. So maybe top players do know that. Alder, um, that's the white red legend. I think that this card is on this list because there is a certain bias of top players to play white red. Um, and definitely it was even stronger at the beginning of the format. Maybe it's a bit less now. 
and Battle Cry Goblin nostalgia. We already decided that Battle Cry Goblin is just boomers hanging on to cars that they remember. Uh, where is the hippogriff? Well, it's not there, but it might be that um, actually, if you give me a literal second, I will tell you why it's not there because I can look in the raw data while we're talking about it. Um, hippogriff, 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 hippogriff. It's blessed hippogriff, isn't it? Everyone loves a bit of a quietness during the stream when I shut up and find things in the table. Um, blessed hippogriff. Uh, it's not on the list by not much, first of all. Um, I'll have to go back to the. It's by not, not it is by not much. Here we have Battle Cry Goblin at 10 percentage point difference, and uh, Hippogriff is 8.2. Um, and it's actually quite highly picked by the uh, lower ability players. So um, uh, it's picked 20 percent of the time by the lowest ability, uh, well, by the bottom group, and 29 percent of the time by the uh, top players. And I think that, again, if we would only extract the data from the last two weeks, maybe it would be um, uh, slightly different. Right. Um, now, there are also cards that are picked way, 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 way higher by the uh, uh, lower win rate players. And top three, well, the top one by, by, by quite a lot is the Ancient Silver Dragon. That's the blue one. That's the one that loses your game on the spot when you're a bit lucky with the rolls which is strange. It's really, really weird. But OK, that's how it works. Oh, you do love your blue ancient dragon? I mean, I think that the problem top win rate players are also people who really want to win. And if you really want to win, you can't have a card in your deck that when you play it and attack with it, you can auto lose. And that will happen, I think, reliably with an ancient silver dragon. Maybe maybe it's a plan for the Arena Cube with Tassa Oracle Sisyphus. Uh, then we have a um, couple of cards in uh, Earthquake, Dragon, and Monster Manual. And I think that these particular cards will, will appeal a lot to, um, um, to uh, beginner players, I think. Earthquake Dragon is big and um, looks impressive and then offers you this dream of an amazing uh, curve out when they... Uh, uh uh when they when they can play it for like two mana which would be amazing and it will happen sometimes don't get me wrong but a lot of times it will just rot in your hand so uh, uh you know top win rate players will play the earthquake dragon they will draft the earthquake dragon um but they will choose their uh, spots more carefully. So I think that there are really great homes for that card. I played it in Reanimator deck with three summon undead and bunch of self mill. And then if you manage to get like, you know, turn four earthquake dragon, um, that's pretty oppressive for your opponents. Um, or even if you just mill it to your graveyard and play the dragonborn uh, something, uh, the, the the creature that comes with X uh, plus one plus one counters for power of a card in your graveyard or on the battlefield. And if you even mill the Earthquake Dragon and play turn four, 10, 10 Dragonborn, your opponent is a bit of a, uh, is, is a bit of a, uh, in, in a trap. So, uh, Dakon Star says that um, uh, there are a lot of chase rares here. Yes, there are. But I think that uh, the nice part of looking at those rares is there is a reason why these particular rares are taken by the low win rate players and the other group of rares that we showed in the previous slides are taken by the top winning players and there is a there are certain patterns in here that um um that we can uh, disentangle and i think that cards that offer a dream and in case of ancient silver dragon dream is ooh i attack with it draw seven card woo and i win um, uh, while the reality is that you're risking your whole game with that one attack if you roll uh, 20, basically. Um, Earthquake Dragon also offers a dream, but that dream is actually hard to um, do 
And I think that in order to live that dream, you need to um, carefully build your deck. And I think that this is one of those cards that top players will play less, but when they play it, they will have an insane win rate when uh, beginning players are going to play it more and have actually a mediocre win rate with it. And Monster Manual is another card, like it offers a dream of, of dropping uh, a thing. Um, Sisyphus is asking, so how is Illithid Harvester a bad card? Uh, is it a trap just because it's blue? And yes, that's exactly, I think, what, what I think is happening here. Uh, like, uh, Illithid Harvester is a good card, but it's in blue, and uh, top players will uh, avoid being blue. And because of that fact that they avoid being blue, if they see it later, like in pack three, they will very often not be in a position to play it. Uh, because they are so far from uh, from blue. Um, like Miriam, another card that... Uh, it is a good card, don't get me wrong, but it's also hard to cast. And because it's hard to cast, it doesn't go automatically into every deck. And yeah, then we have some weird rares that probably just uh, are, are, are being picked. I think Gale Conduit of Arcane, that's a weird one, because uh, the card is good, but I think that it's only good when you play it in particular versions of blue green or maybe Timur because the blue green version of Gale is just so much more busted. It basically every instant sorcery spell you play gives two plus one plus one counters to a target, which is insane. Uh, but you need to carefully construct a deck. I played one that was uh, really good and I had blue green Gale a couple of times on the board and it just like always took over the game. It's just like unbeatable force if, if you time it well. Um, but you also have a couple of um, uh, uncommons in there, and there is the uh, Lozan Dragon's Legacy. I think that, again, here it's a color preference. Uh, Blue-red is heavily avoided by top players, I think to some detriment for them, because one of the cards that top players are playing less is the, um, the blue double team thing that brings Lightning Bolts, which is a busted card and could be easily splashed and should be easily splashed. But... Um, and I would probably always pick it just to try to squeeze into my deck because it leads to fun games and also is very powerful. But I think that they slightly avoid playing it, uh, the top players. Um, well, you know, I also like to have fun except, uh, except for winning. It, it must cost me my win rate, but at least uh, it gives me pleasure. And Emerald Dragon is, I think, a card that is slightly disappointing in numbers uh, in terms of win rate, um, but looks pretty good on paper for anything for, um, especially for a beginner beginner player. Look at like six mana flying dragon for uh, four four for uh, uh, for five mana for six mana looks pretty good. It's not. And then we have some like weird rares that are not that much uh, interesting to talk about. Um, so. What about looking just at commons for this metric, uh, said Duck on Star? Well, here, here you have it. Uh, these are the top commons that um, uh, top players evaluate uh, value higher than the, uh, than the bottom uh, win rate players. And we have a Priest of Ancient Lore um, and uh, Prowler as the top two cards. They were already on the previous uh, graph. And then at a bit lower levels, we have the Sepulcher Ghoul, Blessed Hippogriff, uh, Patriarch's Humiliation. These are all... Uh, sort of format defining cards and uh, also all of them are in the black white um and and this is one of the big difference it's not only the card power but it's also uh the color they are in um we also then have the green bounty vampire spawn these are around eight seven percentage points higher picked by the top uh, win rate players pilgrim's eye i think is the card that uh you don't need to be like an expert or anything, but uh, I think that playing several previous sets and understanding how always good those three mana bring a land um, cards were is useful um, to evaluate this card properly. And then we have Deadly Dispute, Sewer Plague, Soldiers of the Watch. You can see that apart from Pilgrim's Eyes so far, all of those cards were white or black um, and, and the difference has become smaller. So this one is five percentage points different, but you also have to keep in mind Soldiers of the Watch are probably picked like, you know, 17% of the time that people see them. Uh, and then we have the first red card in Dragon's Fire, which is just a very solid on rate removal. And again, I told you, removal is usually less valued by the 17 lens users. And uh, definitely the top 17 lens users 
will maybe avoid slightly removal in other formats, but this format looks like it's a bit different. So uh, basically, um, Dragon's Fire and other cheap removal is pretty important in that. We have Incessant Provocation, and I think that this is, again, a card that is a bit of a legacy because AFR, the Steel and Sack uh, theme, was so strong. I think that uh, people are still trying it, but it's also uh, linked to the understanding of the previous format. We knew that um, Steel and Sack can be good. There is good Sack outlets in this format, so uh, people speculate on the Incessant Provocation when they are good uh, because they know that you know they can pick it like maybe pick six, pick seven, and uh, at low cost to their deck, and if they get two, three, then they can start thinking about playing a full-blown uh, Steel and Sack theme deck. And the last two cards that round it up is Steadfast Pally and uh, uh, Shambling Gast, aka Shagavan. Um, so yeah, these are the comments. All of those cards are good. All of those cards have a relatively high win rate, and uh, most of those cards are black or white in two strongest colors in the format. So uh, that's what uh, top versus bottom players evaluate. They are efficient. They will draft with preferences. And I think that uh, the list of those cards shows that uh, perfectly. And the differences in numbers might show additional preferences based on the card powers uh, uh, and utility in the deck. I think that, you know, like lots of decks will totally uh, win or or lose based on the number of priests of ancient lore um when you have like a white green with some life gain synergies peppered in and some blink theme priest of ancient lore is just such an important card for those kind of decks oh let's go further um and here are the commons that top players don't like and the top one is flaming fist officer I think that this is a whole category of cards that is um, always over enthusiastically received by um, uh, beginner players. Because, and again, this is another card that offers a dream. It offers you a dream of that three mana 2-2 two, two, that in five turns will become a 7-7 seven, seven or something. And that dream will happen sometimes, but that dream will very often end on you spending free mana and then instantly getting it killed by something. So Flaming Fist Officer, I think, can be a decent card in some decks, but these will be few and far between and most decks is not going to be great. And even if it's not if good in some decks, it might be only good against some particular matchups that don't deal with the creature very well and you can just keep it and let it grow as the game progresses. So this card is definitely not enjoyed by top players. This card is picked highly by the community. I would assume that if you look at the data from all Arena users, not only 17 lands users, because you have to keep in mind, if you use 17 lands, you're a bit more invested than your average Arena player, you would see even bigger differences that people that um, are not 17 lands users will on average pick the card even higher. So. Um, uh, Flaming Fist Officer is generally like a format trap. But looking at those numbers, that there's also other thought that I had. Um, and uh, if we look at the win rate data, you will frequently look at the generic uh, win rate data. Because cards like Flaming Fist Officers are not going to be played frequently by the top players, there is a part of its win rate that will be lower, not because the card is bad, but because people that are playing it are uh, lower win rate players. And you have to keep in mind uh, that in case of some cards, there can be large differences, not based on the card power, but um, based on uh, who plays them. And this goes on for uh, things like Charm Sleep, Ambitious Dragonborn, uh, and Young Dra Red Dragon. No good player ever would play Young Red Dragon except for Jordan. And Jordan is... Mental, that's what he is. He loves playing his red dragons. Um, I think Charm Sleep is another trap card. It's just that effect that looks pretty decent, but it's not. And uh, I think that um, beginner players might fall into that trap. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Ambitious Dragonborn is another card that requires a careful build around. And I think that it offers a dream and that dream is realistic but it requires dedication and knowing how to achieve that dream. 
And I think that um, top players will know that and they will know exactly when to pick it and um, uh, um, uh, low win rate players might not and might just fall into a trap and play it as a 4-4 and be happy with it. Um, so yeah, Young Red Dragon, uh, the Pseudo Dragon Familiar, I think that these are the cards that are just not aligning well with the format. Um, so yeah, don't bring a Cleric. It looks like it does things because it has many options but it doesn't do much so um uh good players will probably avoid it because the other first of all it just doesn't do what the other two drops in the format do and that's uh that's pretty bad um it's a defensive creature in the format when y is ultra aggressive and therefore it doesn't fit um dragon ball looter uh, just blue part of it must be avoiding blue celestial unicorn is an interesting one i think that again this is a card that offers a dream and this is a trap for beginners players that following that dream. While people that played before in the uh, AFR with it and uh, played with equivalent creatures in the previous format, they know exactly that this creature doesn't go into every deck, so you shouldn't prioritize it if you're not planning to plan it. Uh, planning to play it. Um, I had a bunch of white green decks, and I didn't play Celestial Unicorn. Then I had one when I had three of them, but I also had the uh, uh, two Prosperous Innkeepers and four, I think, uh, Priests of Ancient Lore. And in that deck, I knew this Celestial Unicorn is going to be big. And I, in, indeed, I made them like 10, 9 or something. But I had a deck that was custom built to have Celestial Unicorn. I was picking them extremely highly every time I saw them because my first two pick in the whole draft were Prosperous Innkeepers. Have I not had those Prosperous Innkeepers, I probably would build my white green deck slightly differently and remove those um, life gain synergies from them. Um, and then we have uh, Scaled Nurturer, which I think is not a great card. And uh, I think that, I mean, it's playable. It's just like not something I would super prioritize. And I think that the general consensus of the top win rate players is similar to what I'm thinking. Um, Young Blue Dragon, I think that this is avoiding blue. Minimus Containment is similar to Charm Sleep, a card that looks better than it actually plays, even though it's slightly better in this format than it was before. And here's like the last interesting part, Ether Cup. I think that top win rate players figured out that Ether Cup is not bad, but they also figured out you can have it anytime you want. So why would I waste early picks? I'll pass it, I'll float it, I'll get it. Don't worry. There is time to get the Ether Cup. This is not a priority. And because of that, their uh, taken ratio rate will be slightly lower because they will wait for those late Aether Cups rather than waste early picks because you shouldn't waste early picks on the card that will easily float because if it doesn't float, it probably shouldn't be in the color that you're drafting. Um, and if it does float, then why would you waste an early pick? There you go. Uh, <clears throat> and just um, uh, just to round up, um, because it's very easy to look, compare the uh, top win rate players with the um, uh, bottom win rate players and uh, basically come to the conclusion that there are some mistakes that um, maybe, you know, beginner level players are uh, making or, maybe, you know, not beginner, but people that are starting or people that um, are not drafting so uh, heavily. They still have 17 lands because whatever, but they just play them on occasional draft. So they don't have the in-depth... Um, knowledge of the format but if someone has an over 50 percent win rate across multiple games on 70 lands uh it means that they are a good decent player um maybe just not re yet reaching that uh, 60 percent win rate but um but getting there and it will be interesting to see what is the difference between those top players over 60 percent win rate and those uh, medium players between 50 and 60. and Number one card is Intellect Devourer that I tried to make a point about for seven times uh, while explaining other things in the last slide, so I don't have to go on with that uh, again. But Intellect Devourer seems to be the biggest difference between the people with over 60% win rate and the people um, uh, below 60%. There's a big, big difference in terms of uh, how aggressively is this card taken. And another card that uh, this is actually very surprising that Sea Tower Imprisonment is so much more preferred by the uh, top winner players. And I think that only the color is not fully explain, explaining it. Um, 
Then we have Horn of Valhalla and Suna's Intervention. Horn of Valhalla is a pretty straightforward card. I don't, I don't get why there's such a big difference in picking it. Uh, Suna's Intervention, I already again talked about. I think that this card may be slightly less appealing um, um, if you didn't play Magic for a long time, which would probably mean that you have a slightly higher win rate. Um, then we have Skullport Merchant, um, Raphael, Fiend the Savior. I think that this has something to do that people that are in this medium range of ability are have heard the content, probably a lot of the content, and um, are still on the stage of listening to that content and uh, lots of like old, uh, quite well established knowledge about formats was multicolor cards are not good to be picked early so maybe they will like i don't know skip picking it first or maybe they don't realize how good Raphael is and maybe they will just don't splash it or something like that um and there's the 7.2 percent difference then we have some ancient brass dragon uh elder uh, i think that this is also the multicolor situation here and maybe slight mm, preference of the uh, top winner players to play white red uh, Gearsworth Prowler, again, uh, a card that's super good and might be misevaluated by those intermediate players even. Uh, Shadowheart, Kalein, Cast Down, uh, that's another removal of Guard Fury, another removal. Um, again, showing that this is an exceptional format where removal is valued by the uh, top win rate players. Or maybe where people that draft removal highly are the top rate players because they do the right thing. So don't forget that it can be slightly tough to see what is the cause and what is the effect in here. Is it, do they draft removal because they're good or do they have a high win rate because they draft removal very highly? Um, and then we have last two, Viconia and Clement. I think that these both cards are sort of bombs and, um, well, no, Clement is not sort of bomb, it's just a bomb. Um, and I think top players will be more willing to even splash uh, bombs, even if they are just two drops. So they might pick them more aggressively. <clears throat> and the biggest difference in the other direction, uh, Ancient Silver Dragon, Thion Evokers. Uh, that's the card that I was talking about, the one that uh, conjures a uh, lightning bolt. Um, and I think that, you know, this particular number, I see it. I get why is it, it's hard avoiding blue, but I don't agree with that this card should be avoided and, and neither should be a, a Snowboard Simulacra. Uh, I think that these cards are, you know, there's a case of splashing them if you play something green with uh, multiple Myconids or something red with multiple treasures and you have a couple of Pilgrim's Eyes on whatever. So that, that's why, you know, like prioritizing Pilgrim's Eye opens a whole avenue of splashing to you. And I think that these two cards are worth it. Um, but then we have the, the similar collection of the traps, the monster manual. Um, I think Nefesh, Nefeshni is not a particularly good card that looks like it might be good. Um, uh, we have a bunch of blue things that people avoid. And this is, I think, like a classical intermediate player trap, which is obviously why I try to build around this card as much as I possibly can, because I think the concept of making your mana drugs at four fours or whatever is amazing. And that's Raga Draga Gorgat's boss. That's the uh, four mana four four that gives you an ability of um, um, you, your, your mana creatures uh, get plus two plus two. And if you cast like super expensive spells, it gives plus seven, seven and trample to something. So you have a motivation to ramp because your ramp creatures are going to be bigger and also you have a motivation of casting spells that cost seven or more because then something will become huge and uh, uh, and you win a game like that but uh i think that the, this would appeal to intermediate player um uh and top players that just don't want to be in the red green and they will avoid playing it because that's not a great combination according to them um and out of interesting uh Laws and the Dragon's Legacy, uh, the blue, red, uh, Santos and Common is also on that list, very much like it was on the list with top versus uh, uh, with top versus medium. Yeah. Oh, the still top versus bottom. Okay. Okay. We already had that, didn't we? 
Yeah, that must have been top versus medium. Yeah, I just didn't change the axis. It was definitely top versus medium. Sorry for confusion. Um, now, in terms of common, what is the biggest difference? You can see that those differences are much smaller than they were between top and the bottom uh, players in terms of win rate. Uh, where are the commons there? Um, top versus bottom players had like 12 percentage points difference between Priest of Ancient Lore. 4.6 was basically barely making the list of the uh, top 15 cards in terms of difference. When you look at the top versus medium players, the biggest difference is 5.4. So that would barely make the list and that's Guild Swarm Prowler. That's the most probably undervalued by the uh, medium players in terms of commons. And uh, there is only two percentage points difference between the 15th card. So there is a common evaluation is really close. These are the small differences. All of those cards are really, really strong. And all of those cards are archetype defining. So we have Guildsworth Prowler, ancient, uh, Priest of Ancient Lore, Deadly Dispute, Vampire Spawn, Sepulchre Ghoul, Blessed Hippogriff, Shambling Gust, Patriarch Humiliation, Steadfast Paladin, Soldiers of the Watch, Underseller Myconid, uh, Flaming Fist Dust Guard, Grim Bounty, Genesi Rubble Rouser, and Pilgrim's Eye. Like all of those are sort of in the range of the 15 top commons. And I think that there is something to be said that the players with the top um, uh, win rates on 17 lands also use 17 lands. They know the evaluation of the cards better. And that's that's maybe where the, uh, where, why, where the difference lies. And uh, people that are intermediate, they do use 17 lands to track them, their stuff, but maybe are not as invested in looking at the data and maybe base their pick orders more on some pre-release uh, set review rather than updating the data with uh, what's going on. And, and, and those small differences will arise from that. It's, I'm not saying that they don't look at the data at all, but there might be like a lower um, involvement in, in, in data in their case. And um, again, top versus medium uh, in terms of the opposite difference, Charm Sleep, Dragon Ball Looter, Pseudo Dragon Familiar, Young Blue Dragon, four top cards, all blue. Then we have the Young Red Dragon, uh, again, Benji has probably ruined it. It probably is would have been the number one if not for Benji's drafting. Ambitious Dragonborn, um, Scaled Nurturer, Minimus Containment. All these cards appear like uh, in the same, but the differences again are very small. We're talking just 2.5 percentage points difference in charm sleep between the middle, medium, and top. So it's basically that the medium group is almost up to speed with the valuation with the top group. There are some minor differences uh, and big differences in terms of win rate are related to more gameplay than to difference in pick preferences, although some impact of pick preferences will be there. Uh, oh, OK. Um, again, I, this is wrong axis. That should be top versus middle players. And these are the uncommons. Biggest differences. We have uh, Sea Tower Imprisonment, Skullport Merchant, Kalein, Cast Down, Viconia. It's lots of the same things that we had before. Uh, one of the newcomers is the Ly Liara of the Flaming Fist, uh, the red white signpost uncommon. Um, Null Hunting Party, I think that wrongly more appreciated by the top players because I found this card slightly under underwhelming, but uh, I think that, you know, top winner players will know that double team is great. Therefore, they will try to play the uncommon double team um, uh, card. Um, I think that the only in in other interesting card on that list is you're confronted by the robbers, which uh, means that uh, there is slightly maybe different way that um, uh, top win rate players play their aggressive deck, which, you know, they, they will use uh, this trick slash reach giving card and by reach, I mean like ability to kill, to deal the last couple of damage uh, through it. I think that it's pretty useful. The rest is just more or less uh, samey as the difference between top and bottom players. And uh, in the opposite direction, uh, actually, there's, that's that's sizable differences between the top and medium players. Um, we have the Lozan Dragon's Legacy and Emerald Dragon and Thracus the Butcher. Um, as the top three things. And actually, when you add Swashbuckler, uh, Extraordinaire, and Sword Coast Serpent uh, on number five, the first five cards where the evaluation between top and medium players differ are all dragons. 
uh, they will pick them five percentage points roughly or four percentage points uh, less. I think Sword Coast Serpent is mainly driven by its color, by the rest, I think is driven by its power level. I think that uh, those cards are slightly poorer than you would think they might be. And then we have a bunch of cards that are slightly, you know, less uh, dominantly different between those groups. Uh, importantly, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight dragons and one orb of the dragon things. So uh, it seems that top win rate players don't play dragons, don't have a preference to play dragons. And uh, the ones that stay in the middle play dragons. And maybe that's why their win rate is less impressive because they, 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 they bet on the wrong horse in the early format they were playing. Oh, a Draconic War is another card in there that has dragon synergies. So out of 15 cards where the differences are the biggest, there's a bunch of the ones that are having something to do with dragons. And if they are not with, to do with dragons, most likely they are blue. Is there an exception there? Jade, Orb of Dragon, and Dragon Synergy. Irenicus, Vile Duplication, blue. Allura, blue. Um, Cridal, partially blue. Seek new knowledge, blue. No, so that's just blue cards and dragons. That's, that's the difference between top and medium players in terms of their pick order. And now we've come to the end almost. This is the last uh, piece of data. And um, before I go into it, I need to explain something uh, that maybe is not intuitive. I did it before, uh, but if you missed it, then it will be good for you to know. Um, and then the worst car in the world will be taken 12.5% of the time. And um, again, I'm going to go to the extreme hypothetical. If there would be a card that costs 75 mana, and uh, it says only, if you would draft this card, you lose a draft. Well, obviously, no one would want to pick that because, uh, well, you would lose your draft uh, by just by making that pick, which means you would always get it as a last pick. So having it as a last pick would mean that it would still wheel and uh, go back to the person that was sitting you know, a couple of seats from uh, from the person that opened it. And they wouldn't have any say in what happens. They would have to pick it as a last pick. But still, because it would be picked... Um, 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 it would be picked, you know, like by one of eight people in the pod, it would be taken 12.5% of the time. Now, this means that, to me at least, that if there is a card taken less than 12%... 12.5% uh, of the time by a subset of players. Because if you look at all the players, it will be picked at least 12.5% because there is no choice. You will have to pick a card at some stage. But if you will find a group where that number is lower than 12.5%, there is a much mismatch between this group and the rest of the community. And I thought I'm going to use the last slide on showing the cards that are picked the lowest amount of time by the top players to show which cards top players completely don't care about while the rest of the world cares uh, about them ever so slightly. Because if this number is below 12.5, it means that people that are not in the group that you're looking at actually value this card enough not to leave it to the last pick. And people that are in the group you're analyzing, they don't value it so high, so much that uh, uh, they will not draft it because it will be picked before uh, before the last pick. So that's basically the premise of that situation. Um, and we have a bunch of cards between five and a half and seven uh, percent of, of pickings. So they will sometimes get um, uh, to the last pick uh, uh, by the players. And again, let's look at it. You find the Villus layer is the lowest one at 5.6% only picked. So way below the 12.5 if, if that would be, you know, uh, a card that is hated by everyone. So there is people that will pick, you find the Village Lar, but they are not the top um, uh, win rate group on 17 lands. Then you have, you come to a river, contact other plane, goggles of the night, uh, cloak of the bat, dragonborn looter, guild thief, water weird, lapis orb of dragonkind, dream fracture. All of those cards are blue. And this is the signal for me that the top win rate players hard avoid blue. 
it's maybe because they are top players or maybe they are the top players because they hard avoid blue the reality is that they hard avoid blue and it seems to be doing well for them uh, there's wild shape as the um uh, one of the few non-blue cards on that list it's a green combat trick but then we have another three blue cards in hypnotic pattern timora's invoker and pseudo dragon familiar and then another green card and choose your weapon um so basically from this we can see that top players they definitely draft with preferences then their preference of color uh, means they will not um draft blue and that was the last data slide so um thank you very much for being here um i would like to um send my best greetings to viral misnomer who generated this data for me and kindly shared it with me uh to Hululu, Grant Wu, and uh, ZTM for be developing uh, 17 lands, and especially uh, ZTM in the last uh, weeks has taken the mantle of, uh, you know, trying to figure out how the alchemy uh, cards can be incorporated in the 17 land replay generator. Um, I would also like to thank Fake Jake Brown, who helps me to release this in a podcast format uh, already for months and months, and he's doing that out of the kindness of uh, their heart. Um, and since we are on the topic of the podcast, um, I would like to thank uh, SSKU and Mana Junkie for the music that we're using uh, as the intro. And with that, I'll see you next week.